All right, so good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, OWASP top 10 mobile risks, or uh, maybe we should have put the subtitle in there, you know, why security people can't count to 12. Uh, I don't know, everybody likes 10, so that's kind of what we went with. All right, so we're going to do uh, brief introductions. Uh, we're going to do some, just a little bit of background information on the mobile security project, uh, why it happened, and what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we're going to cover the mobile threat model uh, at a real high level, just kind of talk about the attack surface for mobile apps, uh, what makes them unique, and, you know, where you need to think about applying controls. Uh, we're going to get into the actual top ten themselves, and then uh, whenever, every time we have left, we're going to do some Q&A, um, and then we're going to you know, take it into the uh, Q&A room after this. So as myself, I'm uh, Jack Menino, I'm the, the guy in the middle right there, uh, it's a couple years ago. Uh, so mobile security project uh, leader, uh, do mobile application security stuff uh, back in the East Coast, have a practice back there. Um, like uh, messing around with Android, uh, whenever I have a little bit of spare time, enjoy ripping apart uh, some apps. Uh, my name is Mike Zussman, um, also a co-leader. Uh, we started the project back in about, oh, what was it, Q1? End of last year. Yeah, and end of last year into the first quarter of this year. And I actually went to the uh, OWASP Summit in Portugal this past spring. I believe it was, this, it was in the spring. And uh, we really kicked off the initiative to start honing the, the OWASP Mobile Top 10 there. Uh, my name is Zach Lanier. I'm a principal consultant with the Intrepidus Group. Uh, I just uh, became a co-leader of the project a few months ago, so uh, we've uh, kind of been hammering this out. And Jack will explain a little bit more about the history of the project. So the project uh, started towards the end of last year, and uh, really the initial motivator for the project was uh, coming back for like Black Hat and DEF CON last year. Uh, there were a lot of talks, you know, talking about you know how how broke. Uh, every application like out there is, the platforms suck, you know, develop it as an idiot, you know, the usual stuff, but really nothing anybody could take back with them the next day of work and, you know, actually, you know, go and build a mo better mobile application. So that's kind of where this project uh, came from. Uh, so like on the, on the, right, on the left, well, the right hand side to uh, you guys, um, it's just some of the things we have underway right now. So obviously we, we talk about the risk today. Um, we published some controls. Uh, there's some stuff out there for training. Um, so there's the iGoat project. Um, which actually, he's not here today, um, uh, but imagine WebGoat for iOS, that's what it is. Um, there's the Goat Droid project, it's uh, very similar for Android. Um, and then hopefully, like in the coming months, we're actually gonna start taking the stuff that's out there and start drilling into like really platform-specific uh, guidance. Uh, if you are interested in contributing in any way, shape, or form, we have um, probably more stuff that we wanna do than, than people at this point. Uh, if you wanna get involved, uh, just please come up to us, email us, get in touch somehow, we'd be happy to have you. Sure, just to follow up on that, I mean, pretty much any initiative you can you see in the traditional OWASP uh, avenues, you know, we can have a mobile version of that. So there really is a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity to contribute and uh, a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, we're we're going to touch a little bit on the mobile threat model now. Uh, to be honest, covering the mobile threat model could be probably a 90-minute presentation in and of itself. And uh, we've consolidated that to three slides. And the reason why uh, we're just going to discuss it now is that there are some people who say, you know, why do we need the OWASP mobile project? Why can't we just have traditional OWASP cover this stuff? And, you know, the truth is that there are a lot of big difference between the, the typical uh, web application threat model and the mobile application threat model. Um, we'll touch on some of them here. Mainly, uh, your platforms are going to vary with mileage. Um, you know, on the, on the server side and the web application uh, world, you know, we've got things pretty much standardized, you know, at a high level, but for the most part, anything that's going on on the server, you know, we control. What's happening now with these, uh, within mobile is essentially we've kind of given the developers the responsibility of now writing the browser. Uh, as well as the server side component of everything. So they need to write their own uh, browser, you know, a, a client application, and they need to understand the platform because platforms are going to be different. Uh, iOS is a lot different than Android, and there are things you need to be aware of uh, when coding for a certain platform that can introduce security vulnerabilities. You know, one example that comes to mind is the, um, the screenshotting of an iOS application that can potentially store sensitive data you know, when you, go, when you close your device or go to the home screen. That's just one example. Um, also different from the web application world are the traditional use cases. Um, 
or typical use cases. Uh, the mobile device, it's in your pocket, it's with you all the time, and it's got access to a lot more data than your web application does, or the, the, the web browser does. It's got ac direct access potentially to your client information, to your phone state, to your SMS messages, to your location. Um, it's essentially a tracking device that's with you all the time, which is a lot different than a web browser or a traditional web application. But at the same time, we still need to consider much more than what's going on on, on the client side. Um, there are a lot of back-end remote web services now. You can sync data seamlessly from your device up into the cloud. So how do we protect that data? How do we protect personal data as opposed to corporate data that may be on the, on the same shared device? So there's a, a lot of questions there. Um, we can also talk about the actual um, architecture of, of mobile devices. Uh, you know, it's no longer just uh, an application talking over the internet to, to a web server. Now we've got the, the broadband connection through the carrier where we're talking to the cloud. We've got all of the uh, kind of uh, alternate communication channels such as SMS and phone that are on the device as opposed to just your, your internet connection. Then on the, on the left hand side of this image we see uh, other forms of data connectivity. We've got Bluetooth, we've got NFC, we've got uh, Wi-Fi. All of those different interfaces for communication can affect the way you write your client application. Uh, just a quick example of, uh, of how that can affect how you code an application. You know, we've seen apps that, hey, if they're talking over the phone's broadband connection, talking to the internet that way, they're fine, they're using SSL. But then there's some logic that says, oh, if we're on Wi-Fi, don't use SSL. So there are considerations like that, you know, at design time, at an Im implementation time that developers need to be aware of. Not to mention the fact that uh, there's a physical threat to the phone security. If you lose that phone, there can potentially be a lot of data on that device that can be easily accessed through um, direct access to the hardware. Uh, that's something you don't typically have to worry about with either you know, a desktop machine. You're most likely not going to lose that. And even in a laptop, you know, we have controls like whole disk encryption that can protect data at rest if the device is lost or stolen. So a lot more to be aware of uh, on a mobile device. And just to represent all this information in uh, another format here, we've kind of laid it out in a stride format. And as you can see, it can get very verbose and detailed very quickly. And that's why you know, one of the things we need to work on for the project is an actual uh, a detailed mobile threat modeling project within OWASP Mobile. And like I said, this can be a 90 minute talk in and of itself. So with that, um, that's kind of the rationale. Now we'll jump into the top 10 risks and I'll throw it back to Jack to start that off. Cool. So part of what came here for, right? Uh, so the top 10 risks, uh, one of the challenges was staying uh, as platform agnostic as possible to, to kind of sort of make everything relevant across the platforms, but not being too generic. We were saying things like, you know, bad security issue and stuff, right? Uh, so it still has to be useful. Uh, we focused on broader areas of risk vice, you know, individual uh, vulnerabilities themselves. So, you know, cross-domain something, cloud hopping, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we didn't get that grand anymore, but we kind of sort of uh, broke it down into areas of risk that encompass all those things. Um, there are a lot of people that actually helped out with um, just coming up with this. Uh, we're going to post those um, probably next week to the wiki as well, just to, you know, so they get their fair share of uh, credit. Uh, so here's where we see the top 10. Now keep in mind this is also a release candidate. So um, we're going to open it up for like 60 days, um, similar to what they did with the web top 10 a couple years ago. Um, we really want feedback. I mean, if you guys um, are out there testing out. By the way, how many people actually um, test mobile apps in the security? Okay, cool. All right, yeah, so um, cool. Uh, so I mean, if you guys have anything to, to add, if you think anything just doesn't belong up there, it should be higher or lower on the list, just please, we, we, we really need the feedback. Uh, so first up, um, insecure data storage. So uh, this applies to stuff that's on the device, but we're also considering um, the stuff that's on the device that ends up, say, being synced to, say, you know, at some point the iCloud or, you know, insert uh, anything else up here. Uh, also, if you're backing up data to, say, you know, Google's, ba you know, Android backup services or up in, at some point that data is going to end up somewhere that you just don't control it, um, whether it's going to be local backups to the cloud. Uh, people are going to lose their devices. <laughs> Um, you really have to consider what you're putting on devices. Now the challenge is that, I mean, if you don't cache anything on the device, you don't store anything, well, if someone's on the train or, you know, they're on a plane or something like that and need to get that data, 
and they can't get to it for hours, you know, they're, they're going to be pretty pissed. They might find another app to use. Um, so you have to balance, you know, those those usability things with security. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, there's going to be compliance requirements, and uh, you know, you shouldn't be storing credit cards, SSNs, uh, stuff like that. You should keep off there. Um, some platforms do a better job providing stuff like BlackBerry kicks everybody's ass in terms of like encryption and stuff like that on devices. I um, mean, iOS is a little better, and Android's like you're pretty much on your own. Um, so here's an example from uh, uh, last year, the uh, City phone, uh, Citibank app. Um, everything you could possibly do wrong, uh, they did. So I mean, they were storing account information, uh, just, yeah, uh, really bad stuff. And here's an example of um, something that you think this is ridiculous, but it's, it's extremely common. So here's, um, this is actually like a screenshot from GoDroid. So here's Remember Me, and then here's, you know, world readable, because files really need to be world readable. Um, and you've just, you know, broken the security model um, of how files are protected and stuff like that. Here's username, password, and then when you do that, and then you end up somewhere down in the fire. Uh, so the recommendation is uh, just, I mean, store what's really necessary. I mean, if you're going overboard, you know, common sense is usually going to prevail nine times out of ten. Um, if you're using something like the SD card or, you know, it's, it's a different file system, it's um, not protected the same way that stuff's stored internally. Um, so you definitely don't want to do that. And uh, I mean, leverage what's there for the platforms. You know, some platforms do a better job. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, as Ice Cream Sam, you know, the next couple versions of Android come out, they're going to get better, hopefully. Um, but regardless, whatever's there for the platform, you know, definitely take advantage of that. Uh, the next one is a personal favorite of mine, and um, we kind of just randomly hashed out who was going to talk about which risk, and I'm really glad that I got to talk about this one. Um, because every mobile, pretty much every mobile application that's useful is really just talking to something else on the back end, something out in the cloud. Usually it's some sort of web service, a uh, RESTful web service, or even just a web app. Maybe it's doing some screen scraping. So really, you know, what we come across are a lot of the traditional OWASP top 10 uh, sorts of risks and vulnerabilities. Um, you know, for, for example, and it was kind of funny to me, I'm recently looking at a, uh, a mobile application, and it was with an organization that had a fairly mature web app sec initiative going on. And, but you hear mobile and all that stuff kind of goes out the window and started looking at the, the server side of the app, which initially wasn't even necessarily considered in scope, but is obviously critical because that's where all the data is stored, that's what the, the mobile client is communicating with. And, you know, there was just no state. They weren't even using session management. They turned it off in WebLogic. And, you know, it's kind of things like that that just make you scratch your head. Um, these developers, they heard mobile and they just went down a completely different path and ignored a lot of things that, a lot of lessons that we've, we've already learned. Um, a lot of other, uh, you know, some other things we need to be aware of. There's this idea that we can trust the client in mobile and we can put, um, you know, make access control decisions in the client code. That's just not a good idea. If it's on the client, it's accessible by an attacker, it can't be trusted. All that stuff needs to be baked into your server side, into your server application. Um, and you know, what, what does this ultimately result in? SQL injection, forceful browsing, direct access to all sorts of things on the server side that you, you shouldn't be able to access. Um, interestingly enough, when the iPads came out and the first iPad hack was publicized, wasn't necessarily a direct hack on the iPad itself, but the, the bad guys, or the internet trolls as they've been described in the media in some articles, um, basically they were able to sniff traffic and see what systems the iPad was talking to. And, you know, I think they found some pretty, you know, textbook direct object reference and parameter tampering in a URL that just let them pull data, you know, in increment an ID you know, from one to one million or whatever, and pull down records of iPad subscribers. So there you go, you know, it was, in the media, it was an iPad attack, it was mobile, but in reality, it was just, you know, poor practices in the, on the web application, on the server side. So really, you know, I wanted it to be pretty terse, and number two in the OWASP mobile top 10 was just, please see OWASP top 10, and OWASP cloud top 10, um, and really, you need to just directly address these sorts of vulnerabilities in your, in your mobile app assessments. And also, at design time, that's when it's really important. Because for whatever reason, at design time, when people hear mobile, they're going to go down a different track. They think it's different, and uh, 
again, they throw out a lot of what we already know. Um, so prevention tips, I mean, it's pretty basic. You know, get involved at design time if, if, you, if you have that opportunity in your organization um, and really push the, the other OWASP resources that are available. So number three on the list is um, insufficient transport layer protection. So uh, kind of what the example that was given earlier was um, uh, an app that, and I think we'll actually, we'll highlight it here in a second, that would switch from um, using SSL over um, the carrier's network to not using SSL or TLS on a, uh, over Wi-Fi because that's probably someone at home, so it's considered a trusted network. So oftentimes we will see um, people who just simply disregard encryption altogether because they just assume it's going to be over um, a trusted network or in some cases over the carrier's network where uh, you know it's in control of another entity so let them handle all the uh, all the, uh, the crypto and controls around that. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, one of the other issues that um, often happens is ignoring uh, uh, the chain of trust um, in uh, SSL cert validation or um, simply just dis uh, completely disregarding any errors that might, um, that might come up around uh, invalid certs. Um, or simply switching over to something like uh, plain text transport um, for uh, if, if SSL ever fails. So obviously this lends itself to things like man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, uh, one of the examples that I, I had actually given previously in, uh, in a couple of talks that was really silly was um, uh, the Foursquare app for Android, uh, which has now been, um, for some reason, uh, considered deprecated, used to send, uh, would actually authenticate over uh, using um, uh, HTTP basic authentication over um, non-SSL encrypted uh, channel. So if you're at Starbucks, you go to check in on Foursquare and somebody uh, man in the middle of you there, uh, then they can check in, uh, you know, check you in at strip clubs or whatever. So, um, and everyone uses Foursquare, don't lie. So the example that um, I was referring to earlier was uh, Android client login security flaw. Um, basically what uh, Google was doing was for certain, certain applications or certain services that they would uh, sync from Android handsets up to their, their services, um, they were encrypting most of them, um, but not all of them. And again, if they were over, uh, over Wi-Fi, they would fall back to um, plain text for certain services, such as Picasa. So people could actually, uh, attackers could actually pull down the, um, the token that was being used to, uh, you know, for like the session token, and then uh, you reuse that for other services. So yeah, this was, um, this was basically what I just said. <laughs> Um, so obviously to, to help mitigate this or prevent it altogether, um, anytime you're doing anything that, that is uh, sensitive such as authentication or uh, transmitting uh, any, sensitive, in, any sensitive data, uh, use appropriate um, you know, SSL or, T or TLS. And uh, I actually see someone in the back who can probably tell us why SSL is broken. But uh, regardless, um, you know, if possible, encrypt anything as, as much as you can or at least use uh, use something that will um, keep that, that data safe leaving the device. And don't assume that uh, even the carrier's network is necessarily trustworthy. As we've seen where things like GSM have been broken, um, we can't necessarily trust that network to be, to be safe. Um, and also validate that certificates are actually, uh, are actually legit and don't just fall back to plain text transports for um, failures. Next up, we have uh, client-side injection. So we grouped kind of every kind of injection under here. So whether it's HTML script injection, SQL injection, um, we just label this client-side injection here. Um, so some things, uh, you know, cross-site scripting, I mean, you know, applications, you know, for starters, every single mobile device has a browser. And then a lot of applications will, you know, they'll integrate like some web stuff and some, um, you know, application stuff. Uh, so, you know, obviously you have uh, a mishmash of technologies there. Um, so SQL injection on, on mobile devices, it's not as um, ridiculous as like say, you know, owning an Oracle backend and having access to all kinds of, uh, you know, really rich, powerful things to do. Um, but at the same time, I mean, you can still tamper with data, you can still read stuff that's on the local device. I mean, which also ties into other things. I mean, if you're making some kind of security decisions um, based on the information that's say in a database, something like that, well, you know, you can find creative ways to kind of pivot and, and do some bad stuff. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, just how some of this stuff is used. Um, so here's an example of something that's uh, really, really recent. And by the way, yeah, XSS makes Skype better or something like that. Uh, but anyway, so th this uh, was actually pretty bad. So then this XSS allowed you to you know, rip somebody's contact list out um, from, their I, you know, from their iPhone. Uh, and here's an example um, of something. Uh, so on Android, you're, you're allowed to bind basically like, uh, it's JavaScript interfaces, so you can bind 
you can bind a uh, you know Java you know Java class Java libraries and everything like that to JavaScript. So when it's actually um, you know executed in, and ran in the in the web view, uh, in theory, cross site scripting right there. So you just have to basically do like window dot SMS JS interface dot send SMS and then you know the appropriate parameters and you fire enough SMS messages at that point. Uh, so you know it's it's interesting because you have one issue which you know leads to different issues based on like the rich features of the platform. Uh, so the recommendation there is don't, don't ever tie like SMS or something like that to, to JavaScript because you're just you're nuts. Uh, and I don't know if I, could, I don't know if I could be your friend at that point. Um, but I mean we, we know a lot about how to fix these things. It's just a matter of just getting people to to actually do it. Um, so I mean if you're pulling untrusted data from somewhere else and you're you know you're you know populating you know you're getting some JSON stuff and you're like okay I'm going to populate a web view or stuff like that. You know do your same due diligence. I mean you know properly encode it in the, in the appropriate context, et cetera, et cetera. Um, if you're, you know, using SQL, uh, anything, if you're concatenating, well, you, you probably haven't been paying attention to anything anybody said for the past, you know, how many years, right? Um, and last but not least, you know, just really think about what you're tying. And, you know, so this, we're going to get into, like, another issue um, where you might not have control. But if you, at least if you have control of the application, just really think about what you're tying um, to some of these, these web uh, pieces of functionality. All right, poor authorization and authentication. Um, you know, I don't know how many apps I reviewed where basically the app was sending the phone number of the device to the server, and that was authentication. Uh, you know, I guess there's a, there's a number of challenges we have to deal with in the mobile space in that, you know, the, the keyboards are much smaller. It's harder to enter a username and a password. We don't necessarily want to store that information on the device, and some people know that, others don't. They, they choose to store that information on the device to make it uh, easier on the users. So what happens is we kind of push developers towards finding an easier way, and they'll use data such as the phone number or other unique device identifiers like IMEI or UDID on, on iOS to authenticate the device to the banking application, to whatever application is enabling access to sensitive data. So the, the concept of strong authentication kind of goes out the window in, in, a, lot of, uh, in a lot of cases. Um, what does that translate to? Well, uh, a small key space, these, uh, these identifiers are easily brute forceable, and next thing you know, you can iterate through everyone's account in the system. Um, same thing goes, uh, for the authorization, uh, you know, I touched on uh, some examples of baking authorization and access control decisions into client-side logic. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at an app where the server sends down uh, a token that says, okay, you're admin, and all of a sudden, new admin functionality opens up in, in the client device, and there were no other server-side checks going on to enforce that. So. You know, you, put, you push this client application down to the user, it needs to have the functionality baked in, whatever the, the higher privileged functionality is. You know, you have different functionality for different roles in the app. You kind of have to accept the fact that the user or an attacker who's reversing this app is going to see, oh, there's this hidden functionality I can get to. But on the back end, you need to remember that you need to perform the access control there. Access control doesn't end at the client. It needs to be enforced on the server. So there are, you know, many ways in a poorly implemented mobile application that you can bypass authentication and assume the identity of other users and gain unauthorized access to data in terms of horizontal uh, privilege escalation as well as vertical privilege escalation because developers assume in many times and many times the design requirements that the developers are following aren't clear or direct enough that all this access control can happen on the, on the client side. Um, this is just an example of uh, using a unique device identifier to authenticate the device. So we see that we're just looking up the device ID to see if it's permanently uh, authenticated or authorized to use the application. And if the device ID is whitelisted, we give the guy an, uh, a valid session token. So that's not the way you need to do it. You need to use strong authentication, strong credentials, secret data that is not easily brute forceable or discoverable. Um, contextual inf information can you know, enhance the authentication experience for a user, but really only as part of a multi-factor implementation. I mean, you need to have multiple factors of auth. 
Um, out of band doesn't necessarily work if the out of band mechanism is on the same device. For example, uh, sometimes we see that uh, username and password is sent to the server and then the server sends back um, a valid session token or some other uh, piece of data key to uh, session management over SMS. Okay, that's out of band. If you're sniffing traffic on, you know, at some point, you're, you're probably not going to see that SMS message go through. But if you've already owned the device and you can create an event handler that's looking at all incoming SMS messages, well, that rogue application on your device is going to see that SMS. So out of band uh, really needs to be out of band if you're going to go that route. Um, and you know, the real important thing is never use a device ID or a subscriber ID as a sole piece of authentication data. You need to have multiple factors. Um, you know, one other thing I just want to touch on before we go to the next one is this was actually the first slide that didn't have a, a relevant news article, but one of you know the the higher level risks that we see there, it's, there seems to be much more of a reputational risk for organizations that are pushing out mobile apps. You can do something really simple, such as you know, uh, don't turn on strict certificate validate, uh, validation checking for SS for your SSL connections, and next thing you know, you're written up in the Wall Street Journal and you know, your organization gets a black eye. So one of the things that Arian Evans was talking about yesterday was how do we communicate to uh, senior management all these problems to help get budget? Well, it seems like in the, in the mobile space, it's much easier to get written up and have that widespread reputational damage. So that's just kind of food for thought out there uh, you know, in terms of how do you relay this information up the chain and get resources to do not just mobile application security, but uh, application security in general. So actually, I wanted to add, add to that too. That also, um, M5 also applies to uh, servers um, authenticating themselves to the client as well. Um, so making sure that the client can actually um, know that the server is authorized to do an action. One of the examples that I wanted to give really quick was um, uh, an app where uh, it was a, an endpoint security uh, solution for mobile and um, it would issue remote wipe commands uh, over SMS. Um, and it took about a very short period of time to um, figure out that the, um, the actual authenticator was the phone number concatenated with a, um, a static string and MD5. So if you could just figure out what your phone number was, or the bad guy could, knows what this, this string is, makes the digest of that, sends an SMS to your phone with that and the command to remote wipe your device, your device gets blown away. So authenticating the origin of messages, um, authentication should also, and authorization should be built into the client as well. Um, so improper session handling. Um, so this kind of uh, this kind of goes back to some of the authentication and authorization issues as well. Um, typically, uh, because of usability requirements um, and because we can't necessarily guarantee the fidelity of a connection uh, that a device has, um, people we often see uh, will put a more uh, a longer like a, a token with a longer lifetime, or they'll stat you know they'll store. Um, the token somewhere insecurely, kind of going back to some of the other examples earlier. Um, or they will use homegrown uh, session management or not use session management at all, uh, like Mike was saying. So um, one of the things that uh, we also see is um, people simply using a device ID as, as a session token. And well, that session token never really expires because it's a device ID and as mentioned before, will persist. Um, uh, one of the things that is mentioned in here is OAuth, which I think personally is a really great thing. Um, it's not foolproof, but it does it does definitely address some of the, the traditional issues uh, around mobile uh, mobile session management. Um, so some of the things that you know we would recommend is expire tokens. These are these are web services. Uh, they do have the ability to actually expire tokens. Um, it's, it kind of sucks that your user might have to put in a username and password again, but if your application is sensitive enough, it wouldn't hurt to do that. Um, something like OAuth, uh, for instance, does support the ability to actually remotely revoke tokens or uh, through some, you know, typically through a web UI. If any of you have ever used Twitter, I'm sure at least two of you have, um, there's actually an interface where once you've granted uh, an, a third-party application access to your account, you can actually later revoke that, uh, that uh, that authentication token that that app will use to access your account. So having an interface like that to be able to, uh, to turn that off is also, also recommended. Um, obviously, typical session management, session handling uh, things apply here. 
don't use easily guessable um, or poorly uh, poorly generated um, uh, session tokens. So that kind of goes back to traditional OWASP top 10 stuff. All right, so next up on the list, uh, and this is something that really applies uh, for the most part to uh, iOS and Android um, the most. Uh, so security decisions via untrusted inputs. Uh, so on iOS, you have the concept of URL schemes. So uh, for example, let's just, here's a quick example, just for anyone who's not familiar with it. Uh, so right there you have an iframe, you have Skype, colon, phone number. Uh, so that's an example, so when, when the OS, uh, you know, it sees that, okay, something's called with Skype, it's gonna fire off the appropriate application that, that knows how to handle that. Uh, so the issue with this um, in particular was that it, it would actually allow, uh, so somebody actually just, you know, iframed it like that, and it hit the Skype application, and the application didn't say, hey, user, do you really wanna make this phone call? Or just let the phone call go through. Uh, that's definitely a problem. Uh, so going back a slide, uh, so yeah, Android, um, something similar, I mean, um, not gonna get into intents and the whole permission system and you know, how that works between components and stuff like that. Uh, but in the Android world, um, anyone can, uh, uh, just gray out of the, you know, vanilla out of the box, um, any application can start like an intent, you know, with, you know, if you don't have the permissions around, or not intent, um, an activity, right? So an activity is like, you know, if you open up your application, you know, you're looking at an activity. Uh, it's a single, you know, single thing you can basically do. Uh, so if you're firing off, say for example, like as soon as that activity fires off, you're firing off like saying like an async task or something like that, that does something really, really bad, uh, that's not good. Uh, so if another application would say start, you know, um, delete account or whatever, or make like, you know, obscene um, transfer or something like that, uh, you're not doing additional things to validate, you know, who's calling it, um, you know, does the user really accept this, uh, that's an issue. So there's, there's a really rich, um, and we could, again, we could spend a lot of time in this. Uh, but at least from like an inter-process type thing, application application is a really rich um, attack surface for this kind of stuff. And we just hit that. Uh, so the recommendation is, um, you know, check who's calling it. Uh, so I mean, there are permissions like, uh, and if it's something sensitive, you know, go the additional two or three steps. I mean, same, the same thing you do, you know, on a conventional web application, um, you know, to say for example, like change user settings, you might make them re-authenticate or something like that. You definitely need those additional, um, you know, checks and stops in place. Um, otherwise, you're just going to set yourself up for failure. Um, yeah, so not going to hit that. That that's that's one that I could probably like really get out of control with, uh, but we're we're not. So, I'm going to turn that back over to. Yeah. Uh, so side channel data leakage. Um, this this is pretty interesting. Uh, we've we've seen like trip you know, typical issues around people storing too much client side in web browsers, that's kind of a well understood yeah, science there. Um, <coughs> but of course, uh, as Mike mentioned earlier, that, uh, that screenshot issue on iOS, uh, where um, by default, when you hit the home screen or, or turn off the device, or lock the device, <coughs> it actually takes a screenshot of the app. So if you have uh, that, that app, that screenshot cache can be recovered. So if you had a, you know, a screenshot up with a login prompt or an account transfer prompt or something, that could, would be a, a side channel for, for data leakage. Um, obviously web caches are still a concern on mobile devices and mobile apps as well. Um, there are issues around keystroke logging. For instance, in um, Android you can uh, install things like Swipe, which is an alternative keyboard. There are uh, also uh, spyware apps, um, legit, legit spyware apps that will install an alternative keyboard so that you can uh, watch what your teens are doing and what you know, Facebook uh, things they're doing and entering into um, SMS messages and whatnot. And that actually stores a log somewhere of all the keystrokes and also syncs it somewhere else. So if an attacker was able to enumerate the apps installed, they could probably guess the location of that log. <coughs> um, also, one of the things that we, we see a lot are a lot of debugging messages being put into uh, logging facilities on uh, mobile devices. Uh, the guys over at Lookout actually um, did a talk uh, last year at Black Hat where they, they, in one of their examples, they said, How, what's the minimum amount of things we can do to successfully uh, exfiltrate data from an Android device? So what they did was, um, one of the examples they gave was have an, a, an app only request the read logs permission. And then they just looked for certain things that were hitting the log and then uh, just popping up the web browser and the uh, HTTP posting or HTTP get to uh, an endpoint they controlled with information they were pulling from the log. So apps will oftentimes log very complex or very uh, uh, sensitive information to debugging facilities. And then of course temporary directories where you might be storing files for um, that might otherwise be uh, removed later but 
uh, could have sensitive information in there. And of course, uh, third party libraries. Um, one of the uh, examples that um, uh, comes up typically is uh, third party ad libraries, which leak a lot of information about uh, the user location information, device information. That's something that you would want to consider. Um, uh, know that if uh, uh, something like Pandora, uh, it was, was an example where it was uh, leaking a lot of information about the users, much to, uh, much to their ignorance. So um, you know, be aware of, of what they do. And here's an example of, of a, logging, uh, a logging issue in, um, in iOS uh, where, Jack, did you, this is your example? Of the uh, the iOS one. Oh, so um, in this case, basically what it's doing um, is actually just writing out to a to a, a warning log um, the information that's being put into a uh, into a login form here. So you know some of these logging facilities are pretty easy to access from a seemingly legitimate app and would otherwise be really easy to pull uh, sensitive information out of. So don't log credentials. Don't log um, PII. Don't log. Um, in some cases, I've seen developers actually log. Uh, they'll otherwise obscure their code really well and use things like ProGuard, um, which is reversible but still is just upping the ante. But then in the log messages, they'll show exactly how their HTTP requests are constructed. So then using that information, you can easily attack the back end. <coughs> if you are um, on iOS, uh, disable screenshots for your app or just don't store information that, um, or put information that uh, would otherwise be included in a screenshot when the user hits the home screen. Um, remove any debugging messages that might be uh, put into your into your app before you release it to production. So a lot of typical kind of um, you know best practices around software development here, and then um, also third party stuff. So crypto is really hard. <laughs> um, I don't know if anybody follows any of the SSL stuff going on, but you know even certificate authorities who have tons of money to spend on doing it right can't seem to do it right. So how this all trickles down to mobile app developers is, well, crypto is hard. There's a lot of opportunities for failure. Uh, and the two primary categories for failure, you know, much like in the web application world, are either using broken implementations or implementing known uh, algorithms improperly, or just deciding to roll your own crypto and create something that's, in many cases, trivially defeated. Um, other common mistakes, uh, encoding does not equal encryption. There's still people out there who think base64 encoding is encryption. That's, that's not the case. Uh, obfuscation is not encryption. Uh, just swapping bytes and mixing things up, that's going to be figured out. And serialization does not equal encryption. Just putting something into, uh, you know, uh, a not as easily decipherable data format is not going to protect your data from somebody who has a vested interest in, in accessing it. Uh, and when we're talking about all this, uh, you know, kind of reversing a, you know, a homegrown crypto algorithm, you need to remember that on many of these platforms, it's somewhat trivial once you have the application in hand because you downloaded it from the marketplace or from your organization's website that it's easy to bring it down to either bytecode or in some cases source code uh, and actually reverse the logic that's baked into the app. Um, you know, I, I've seen many examples of this. This one was kind of interesting. So this was actually a BlackBerry application that was designed to basically sync images and other data up into the cloud. Um, but the developers, they actually had to write this application to work on like version four of the BlackBerry API and version five. And one of the, you know, 4.6. whatever actually had uh, a bug in the SSL API. Like I said, crypto is hard. Uh, this is in RIM code. This wasn't something that the developer, uh, a bug that the developer introduced. He had to work around a, an implementation flaw in, uh, in the platform. So the actual bug in the platform was that in a post over HTTPS over a certain number of bytes would just fail with, with, for no reason seemingly. So what they realized was that, okay, they knew they needed to protect this data somehow, so they decided to implement um, an asymmetric crypto implementation uh, using triple des, but what they did was they put in a, a hard-coded static key uh, that would have been the same on any 
installation of the application. So if a million people downloaded this app and were uploading data on this version of BlackBerry, then all that data traversing the wire would be easily recoverable because the key was easily recoverable from, from the Java bytecode, uh, which was uh, you get the Java bytecode from a, a RIM COD file using a utility named Codec, which is uh, somewhat flaky. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Fortunately, it worked here. So that, that, this example just goes back to show you um, you really need to understand the limitations of the platform. Um, the platform developers make mistakes too. Uh, so how did we how did we fix this? And it was kind of interesting. The really I told them they needed to use uh, asymmetric uh, cryptography, where uh, you know they could still use the server's public key to encrypt this data and send it up over the wire. For whatever reason, they didn't decide to go that route, and they actually wrote a whole new web service that the application could pull to retrieve a new symmetric key. And the funny thing was, at first, that symmetric key was also static. <laughs> So everybody was just getting the same key. So then they built a whole new, you know, a lot of additional server-side functionality to map the new symmetric key to the session. So again, I mean, it was better, I guess, but still overly complex. Um, interestingly enough, recently I've been looking at another, uh, I looked at a BlackBerry application and a Windows Phone 7 version of the same application. And in the BlackBerry application, they were using keys generated on the device, not necessarily using Java Secure Random. Um, they needed to encrypt data, so they were doing it okay, but one of the uh, other problems I, I flagged them for, the default, uh, what is it in, on RIM, it's the uh, AES encryptor engine, by default uses electronic codebook ECB mode for encryption, which you, know, you can go to the Wikipedia article and they, the, the example they use is a, an encrypted image of the Linux Penguin and you still clearly see the Linux Penguin because there's no interference you know, uh, in, introduced into the actual encryption process. So that's the really, that's the math stuff that I'm not qualified to talk about. But it could have very easily just implemented uh, CBC mode, cipher block chaining and using initialization vectors which they just needed to do that. Funny thing was on the Windows Phone 7 app, um, by default, and I did some research just looking into that, you know, all the code examples used CBC mode, used IV, used a, a stronger mode of encryption. So just between the two versions of the same application, it, you know, the, the Windows Phone 7 was a little bit better out of the box. That developer had, in, in my opinion, they had a better chance of success just based on the platform uh, and the resources available. So, some prevention tips. Um, again, don't roll your own crypto. Crypto is hard. That's something we've been harping on for years. Um, don't necessarily store the key with the encrypted data. Um, you need to utilize the, uh, the, the secure storage mechanisms of the platform. So, in Windows Phone 7, there's isolated data storage. There is, um, on, uh, I, I, uh, the name escapes me of the the RIM version of isolated data storage, but there's a way to use uh, code signing to actually restrict access to a data store only to that application. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than on the on Windows Phone 7. Uh, but basically, you want to make the key uh, hard to get to from a rogue application. So if the, if the device falls into the hands of an attacker or the application falls into the hands of an actual person, he's going to get at the key. But what we can prevent using the appropriate data storage mechanisms of your platform is a rogue application from being installed on the device and just being able to access the encrypted data and access the key. So we need to protect the key from programmatic attacks. Um, and again, you know, we just need to take advantage of what the platforms already provide and need to make sure that our developers understand what the platform provides. So last up, uh, number 10. Uh, so for this one, we, we distinguish between uh, what's stored on the devices as insecure storage. So if it's stored to the file system external to the application, then that's insecure storage. If it's hard coded into the app um, in the binary and compiled and all that good stuff, then we're, we're grouping that under number 10. Uh, so some platforms, it's, it's definitely a bit easier to, to reverse an app, uh, you know, back to, you know, actual code uh, than others. But at the same time, you know, in the end, it's, 
you know, it's, it's very similar to some of the stuff you see to what, you know, happened when people started pushing more logic down to the browser. So the whole Web 2.0, Age Action, or whoop de doo uh, thing happened and people just, you know, lost a uh, sense of good judgment. They said, oh, well, you know, just push down to the browser, who cares, you know, it's not visible to the user, it's, you know, it's in a hidden form field, so what can go wrong, right? Uh, so very similar, I mean, you'd be amazed at the crap that people are just like putting into their apps. Uh, you know, like this is, it seems a little ridiculous, but it's really not. Um, this kind of stuff, and it's like, oh, hey, no, don't worry, it's, it's in the app and, and no one's gonna get to it. I mean, anything, just like a browser-based application, I mean, if you're giving it to the client, if you're, you know, a desktop, I mean, it's, it, in the end, it's, it's a piece of software. Um, if someone has it in their possession, I mean, eventually, um, they're, they're gonna get uh, what they want out of it. Uh, the recommendation, it, I should actually put like number one, just use common sense, use your brain. Um, if it's really sensitive to your business, from whether it's from, you know, say, um, an intellectual property perspective or from a security perspective. So, I mean, if you're, you know, putting creds, you're putting, you know, sensitive endpoints that, you know, might have taken like 20 years to, you know, brute force enumerate and stuff like that, um, you, you, you messed up. Uh, recommendation, keep it out of the application. If it's not necessary, it doesn't belong in the binary. Uh, so with that said, we have about four minutes left, so a uh, really quick wrap up. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna keep it open for about 60 days. Um, if there's anything you don't agree with in there, um, come talk to us. Um, in the next phase, we're gonna try to get more. Um, we got some metrics, I mean, we got a good amount of feedback, um, but we really want, you know, from people that are doing a lot of assessments and seeing a lot, um, and even people that, you know, internal uh, dev shops that are, you know, seeing, you know, here's issues and, you know, across our portfolio applications, we're really interested to just kind of share data across different industry verticals and stuff like that as well. Um, we're gonna try, maybe it's gonna happen, maybe it's not, but to go with like a 12 month release cycle for this. Um, the, the interesting thing is that, you know, just how fast these platforms are moving along. Um, you know, new things, I mean, you know, we haven't seen, you know, NFC, you know, it's gonna be the next big boom and people are just gonna lose their, their brains again um, when they start rolling out <laughs> NFC apps. Uh, so we wanna try to keep it as current as possible just so people working with data that's actually relevant um, for the current platforms. Uh, so conclusion, so I mean, we, we've, we've started to identify these issues, but the next um, set of things we need to do. So we really need to start getting into individual, individual platforms themselves and really drilling down some really good practices. Um, there's been talk about doing, um, you know, like a SAPI for Android, a SAPI for um, Objective-C, uh, iOS. Uh, so I mean, these are good things. I mean, the, the more, ultimately the more of these tools we can put in the hands of developers, in theory, you know, they'll, they'll start building better applications. Uh, so with that said, that's all we have. Thank you. Thank you.